Last, uh, the last time I preached here, about two weeks ago, I, we went through three passages of Scripture and we looked at how there are certain passions in this world that, that hijack our hearts, that draw us away from God. Well, what I want to share with you this morning is going a little bit further in that direction. I want to share with you something that um, will hopefully be very practical to you. I want to give you principles and I want to give you just a few case studies from real life, actual applications, so that you can get a feel for not only what these things are that hijack our hearts, but what the, what the sometimes common behaviors are that are moved by these counterfeit gods, by these functional gods, by these false gods that hijack our hearts. You know, behaviors and actions and things that happen in our life, some of them are obvious to us. They're, they're just like, yep, that's not nice. We get that. Uh, we don't always know what drives it, but we can see straight away this is not on. There are other things that are more subtle. You know, everybody does it, and so it doesn't really seem that objectionable to us. And so we'll look at a few examples and throw some of these things around a little bit. And so I've entitled the message for this morning, overthrowing the tyrants, overthrowing the tyrants. These things that hijack our hearts, they seem like they will do us a favor, but they become tyrants ruling us, dictating to us, and uh, causing mayhem and chaos in our lives. So to start off, I want you to turn to Matthew chapter 22, Matthew 22, and a well-known passage that uh, the moment you read it, you'll know straight away where we're going, and you'll recognize these words. Matthew chapter 22. Right. Jesus is asked a question, and the question is captured in verse 36. His answer goes through from 37 to 40. So here's the question. Now remember, this question was asked as a trap. This was a question that was not actually originally intended by the asker, by the questioner, to be something which was a question of inquiry. It was designed to put Jesus in a corner, right? And the question is this. Teacher, which is the great commandment in the law? If you had to single one, one commandment out, Jesus, what would you say is the greatest commandment in the law? Verse 37, Jesus said to him, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. Did you take that in? You shall love the Lord not with a part of your heart, not with most of your mind, not with a good intention. No, you shall love the Lord. The, 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 the chief commandment, the one that ties everything in Scripture together with everything else is this one unifying principle. All of God's intentions for us are love, and all of what He intends for us to become is love. Does that make sense? One great commandment. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. In fact, I want to I I be radical with you. I want to say this morning that if you and I were actually able to understand what that means in its full depth, in its full breadth, in its full length, if we could actually comprehend that absolutely and completely, that would be the only thing that God would ever have had to say to us. Our challenge is we don't get that. <laughs> we think we know what love is. But it's confused because our hearts are hijacked by things that cause, cause counterfeit loves. Our, our love, which should belong to God, is drawn away to things that, 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 that they shouldn't, that, that love shouldn't, that affection shouldn't be attached to, right? You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, with all your mind. And then Jesus goes the extra mile, if you like, and says, I know you didn't ask this, but let me just make it clear anyway. This is the first great commandment, but the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. So if you think I was making that thing up about if we could understand love, that would be the only thing God would have to say to us. That's what Jesus is saying. On these two principles, this one principle of love supreme to God and love to others, right? Self-forgetfulness, investing in God, investing in others. On this hangs all the law and the prophets. The entirety of Scripture, the entire revelation, everything God has ever tried to tell us about Himself is to win our affection. It is to demonstrate what true love is. His interest in us has always been for our well-being. 
And he says to us, all I ask is the one thing I've given to you. I have given to you supreme love. Supreme love. You think, how can God give us supreme love? Because God died for us. He has loved us more than he has loved himself. Does that make sense? That's the idea of supreme love. He has, he has sacrificed himself in order to, to redeem us, to save us from certain destruction. He loved us more than he loved himself even. And he says, that's what I want from you. That's the safety of the universe. When people love like that, when they love me like that, when they love others like that, if everybody loved like that, the universe would be a safe place. God wants supreme love. That's his expectation, plain and simple. When you go to Ezekiel chapter 14, you find a very interesting passage. Now, this is the heart of the Old Testament. And in the heart of the Old Testament, there was a lot of idolatry, right? And by idolatry, I mean physical idolatry. You know, they, they, they carved images, they set up statues. The nations around them had trinkets and lucky charms and, and, and literal idols, physical idols, that you would go to a certain place, to a, to, a, to a false god's temple, and you would bow before a physical entity. Does that make sense to you? But Ezekiel comes along in the heart of this physical idolatrous culture and he transfers the idea of physical, adultery, uh, um, physical idolatry to a heartfelt idolatry. He says, for anyone who separates himself from me and sets up his idols, where? Where? In his heart. Do you see what Ezekiel's doing? He's moving the concept of physical idolatry. He's saying not all idols have to be physical. Some idols exist in our minds and in our hearts without carving a single block of wood, without, without carving a single block of stone. There are idols that can hijack the heart. And God's warning is, for anyone who separates himself from me and sets up his idols in his heart and puts before him what causes him to stumble into iniquity, I will set my face against that man. So notice this. Whoever sets something before him, that's the physical act of physical adultery, right? Bowing in front of a statue. He says, before you have carved that block out of stone, before you have carved that piece of wood and bowed and worshipped it, before that the affections of your heart have been taken away from me. That idol has been set up in your heart before it becomes a physical act. This is what happens in the Garden of Eden. Adam and Eve, something took hold of their heart. There was a lust that they cherished, that they chose. They wanted to be like God. The very temptation that Satan fell into in heaven that caused his fall, he sold that to the human race. Their, their sin was not merely that they ate from a tree that God said they shouldn't. Naughty boys, naughty girls, slap on the wrist, let's move on. No, the point was that they committed idolatry in their heart and that manifested in outward behaviors and outward actions. And I I suggest to you, I suggest to you on the basis of that case study, on the basis of Ezekiel, that if you were to, to do your, some heart searching and ask what drives your brokenness, what drives your, your, perpetual, your perpetual, habitual, cherished sins, those sins that you are beset with, the ones you can't seem to break the cycle of. What you will find is this is not merely an external behavior thing. You shouldn't just be praying for the, the manifestation of sinfulness, the actual outward, you know, Lord, help me to stop doing this. Help me to stop reacting like that. Help me to stop saying this. Help me, you get what I mean? Before that thing takes place outwardly, there is a heart idolatry. And until that, until that God in your heart is dethroned, removed from the scene of action, you will perpetually fall into those broken behaviors. No matter how much you pray about the externals. Because there's something that's driving that, Ezekiel says. There's an idol that's been set up in the heart. And then I set something before me on the outside that that idol calls for, that it hankers for. But this can't be true of the New Testament, right? The very concluding words of 1 John. 1 John is written by who? John, the same John who wrote the Gospel of John, the same John that wrote the book of Revelation, that John, right? The beloved disciple, the one that Jesus loved, you know, the disciple that is all about the heart issue of love. That John concludes the letter of 1 John by saying, little children, my parting comment to you is keep yourself, what? From idols. 
Keep yourself from idols. Now, I'm very much aware that the New Testament culture didn't suddenly evaporate physical idols. The Roman culture was, there was a plethora of, of physical idols and temples in the Roman culture that they'd inherited from Greece, which they'd inherited from Medo-Persia, which they'd inherited from Babylonia, which they'd inherited from Assyria, so on and so forth. That, that was there. But it's interesting that John, who obsesses about the issue of love, in the same letter, he says, he says, my children, my children, perfect love casts out fear. The, he, he says, by this we know that we love God, that we love the brethren. You know, John is, John is obsessive about this concept of love, which is a heart issue. And he concludes the, 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 his letter, his counsel, by saying, keep yourself. In a New Testament era, after the death of Jesus, keep yourself from idols. Counsel, I believe, which is still very, very valid today. So the question becomes this, what is it that drives our heart idolatries? What is it that goes on inside of ourselves? And the same author, John, who just gave us this counsel, keep yourself from idols, in the same book reveals the core principle. So I want you to turn with me to 1 John, towards the end of the New Testament. We're looking at 1 John chapter 2. And verse 16. First John chapter 2 and verse 16. The first component that is involved any time an idol takes its place upon your heart, an affection that is due to God, that is placed upon something that it shouldn't be upon, right? First John chapter 2 verse 16, it says, For all that is in the world, and now listen to this, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of the of life. Where is the locus of operation? Where, where is that happening? He says it's in the world, but you can tell by the nature of his description. Where is that happening? Is that happening in somebody else or is that happening in you? It's inside of us, right? It's this, it's this, this, this sin's resonating chord, if you like. Inside of us is an answer to sin. Inside of us is a, a machine, a sinful seed that, that sprouts and digs down roots and takes hold of the heart. The lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, the pride of life. These are internal issues within us. The second ingredient, well, let, let me summarize it by saying, you, you, if you want to put it into plain English, it's our, it's our self-centeredness, right? Everything revolves around around me, the wants, the hopes, the fears, the expectations that govern our, our hearts. They come from within and they cause us to want to lay hold of the things of the world, to manifest in behaviors, the way we treat people, the way we talk, internal desires. The second ingredient is the verse immediately before that, verse 15. And he says the following. He says, do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. In other words, what he's saying is, there are actually things outside of us that that hold a certain appeal to us. Now, yes, this is, this is largely driven by what goes on inside of us, but there are things in the world. There are external pressures, if you like. External pressures, the lies that invite us. They model, they reinforce, they condition us. The things we, we see on the movies, our idea of what it means to be a hero or to be a man, our idea of, of, of body image or our ideas, you know, all of these things that are put onto us, the things we learn in the classroom, the things that, are, that our parents teach us. These are pressures that come from the outside. Does that make sense? They, from a very young age, begin to program our mind. But the challenge is that these external pressures, they resonate with the internal desires. There is actually something innate to the human being that, that, that is attracted to these things. And so you have a very dangerous combination here. You have something on the outside of us calling something that answers on the inside of us. Does this make sense to you? You see, our challenge is not just that we live in, in a situation of a sin. Our challenge is that we, we are sinful. 
We don't just, you know, randomly commit acts of wrongdoing on the outside. Those, ra those, those acts of wrongdoing are because there are pressures without that awaken sin within. And the third ingredient that John mentions is in 1 John chapter 3, verse 7. 1 John 3, verse 7. And it's the false lord. It's the one who has always wanted to usurp the place of God, right? That's what this whole controversy is about, isn't it? I mean, let's not take our eyes off of that fundamental principle. The whole reason this world has plummeted into the kind of chaos that it is is because of the principle of idolatry. Lucifer, in his pride and arrogance, wanted to sit on the throne of God. And then, as we said earlier on, he sold that vision. He sold that dream to human beings down here. And ever since then, this world has been plummeted into the quest of a ver variety of idolatrous pursuits. And so the one that sits above this all is the false lord himself, the one who wants to take the place of Christ. 3 verse 7 says the following, Little children, let no one deceive you. He who practices righteousness is righteous just as he is righteous. And he who sins is of the devil. For the devil has sinned from the beginning. For this purpose the Son of God was manifested, that he might destroy the works of the devil. These external pressures and these internal resonating cords of sin, the good news of the gospel is that they do not need to hold you. You do not have to just be in a pre-programmed state to bow to these false gods that are sitting upon the throne of our hearts. There is a Lord, a true Lord, who has come to dethrone the false Lord and his kingdom within us, his kingdom around us. The ultimate victory we see at the coming of Jesus when this environment of sin that with all the pressures, that's going to be with us until, until the coming of Jesus. But, but what Jesus will do for you here and now, what he will do for you as the work of a lifetime is that he will dethrone those gods that sit upon the throne of your heart, break the, the resonating cord between what's inside of you and what is coming at you from the outside, the pressures that the false Lord puts on you as he tries to draw you away from the true Lord, away from Jesus Christ, to bow at his feet. A false Lord, a world that's formed and broken by his, by his vision, by his philosophies, by his pressures, and hearts within us that resonate with evil. Satan stands as the ruler over his kingdom of the flesh, that's us inside, and the world, that is the externals. I love the statement by Dr. David Paulison. He says, idols, idols counterfeit aspects of God's identity and character. Digest that for a moment. What is it that makes an idol an idol? It's that right there. That is at the core of it. An idol counterfeits aspects of God's identity and character. Who God is and what he's like. The idol comes along and says, I can do a better job of that. You want that? That's great. I'll give it to you in the place of God.